mode. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Hang on, I've already slipped through slide number one. This is Coach Lynn, and this is our third webinar of the year, Sport Med BC Sun Run in Training 2017. And I'm so glad you're taking a half an hour out of your day to listen and join us today. Uh, we're here to talk about ways to stay healthy, which is paramount to the whole program. My whole goal as your coach is to make sure that you you know, complete this program safely and comfortably in a way that's right for you. And that would mean that you stay healthy with proper technique. However, there's a however there because there are there are many run walk discomforts that can come about because of the impact that happens with this wonderful sport that you're now taking part of. So today we'll discuss a number of what those a number of things surrounding what those run walk discomforts can look like, what you might be feeling, when you might be doing too much, and we'll draw it back to uh, some of the technique that maybe you can pay attention to when you're out there running and walking. I'm Coach Lynn, for those of you that haven't been tuning into those videos and coaching advice that I try to send out every week. Um, and I'm so passionate about this. It's something that has been near and dear to my heart and I even say it's in my DNA because I love to walk, love to run, love what you are doing and the key is that you're doing it in a way that's totally right for you. So stick with that program, this program that would not happen without the support that we receive from our various sponsors and oh my gosh we are five weeks away from what is the largest 10k foot race in the country the Vancouver Sun Run. Some of you tuning in will be doing it. Not everyone will because you may be way up north and deciding to do an event that's closer to your community. However, who knew that 30 plus years ago, the event that was created on the streets of Vancouver would turn into the event that it is today. And if you ever do get a chance to make the trip for it, it's certainly worth all ages, shapes and sizes there on that starting line and you will be prepared for it because you've been following this wonderful program thanks to these many sponsors the Sun Run in Training stores the Sun Run stores there on the right hand side of your screen are the stores that carry all the gear pertaining to the Vancouver Sun Run and of course they're the ones that provide the footwear that you need to make sure that you're you're properly supported and we know that often injuries do occur because you're just not properly fit with the right kind of footwear for your body type and the way that you walk and run. So much thanks are due to these stores. And if you're in town, you've got a you've you've got the potential to go in there and get yourself a good deal as well on any gear that you might need. So moving quickly forward, week eight. Oh my goodness. Think where you were in January. Remind yourself of that. You've come so far in this eight weeks and you've earned this R&R week, as you know, rest and recovery. Every fourth week, all of the workloads are decreased so that you can recover and then enjoy our final progression and climb, we call it, a progression where your volume and maybe your intensity comes up a little bit further as we prepare for the 10k distance but oh my gosh you've all started in week one with something around a half hour to 40 minutes of walking and running and progress now to where you're up there at you've passed the over halfway 5k point and you're now into this nice rest and recovery time and I so hope you're like my dear friend our leader of the year Rainy from Burnaby on the right hand side there up north in Haida Gwaii super excited just as I am every time we're out there together with people that are enjoying this sport that we love if you're not feeling fantastic, it's time for you to consider exactly what you feel, whether you've got some sort of ache or pain that's plaguing you on any body part at all, and consider other options, maybe decreasing your workload a little bit, taking a break from pavement, maybe jumping in the pool or on the bike to sort of facilitate your fitness. And that's what we're going to talk about today. 
alignment is everything. And when I'm out there visiting different run walk groups, I'm so aware of gently suggesting people stand up a little taller. Imagine that plumb line that goes through your the top of your head right through your spine and holding yourself with with strength, finding the core strength that you need to move those arms forward and back as opposed to rotating in the upper body, lifting the knees in a way that is comfortable in such that you don't overstride and that your foot comes down pretty well underneath the strength that's in your upper body, underneath your hips so that you are properly supported. And together, making an assessment if you are somehow uncomfortable right now, look to that personal injury awareness scale that I've talked about in coaching advice, asking yourself after every session, how do I feel? And hopefully you're saying, I feel great. And you're not saying, oh no, my shin hurts. But knowing that adjustments always occur in your body when you've increased a workload. So a little bit of awareness is okay. It's when you're getting up there at a 5 out of 10 and higher on that injury awareness scale that we need to consider maybe a break from impact if it's not adjusting in the way that it should within a few days or at most a week. And to help me today, not to help, well, not to help me, to help you understand what might be going on in your body, and I'm so pleased Deneen is here to give us some tips on common run walk injuries and just how we can we can avoid them. And Deneen, welcome. There's sh- I see you on the screen, but are you there? All right. Yes, thanks so much. <laughs> um, so yeah, congratulations guys, week eight. I hope everyone's feeling strong and enjoying um, a bit of rest right now. Um, but we're here to talk about what we can do in order to keep ourselves healthy throughout the training program. Um, so I'm excited to chat with you a little bit about some common different run-walk injuries and what we can do um, in order to help treat and help prevent them. Lynn, I'm just having a bit of trouble with the mouse. Okay, hang sure on. I'm gonna, it over. I did, but I'm going to find that bottom screen. There it is. See if you can click on it yourself on that left. Yeah, not allowing me to click on it right now. Okay, bear with me, everybody. I'm just going <laughs> to see if I can, I can find Deneen. Okay, one second. That should work. There we go. I see. You. Perfect. Awesome. There we go. Awesome. So today we're going to talk about um, acute and chronic injuries and what the differences are, different treatments for acute and chronic injuries, the R's of recovery and rejuvenation, and when to stop and when to keep going. So what's the difference between an acute versus a chronic running injury? Um, Acute would be an injury that happens instantly. Right away you know that something is wrong. An example of this would be an ankle sprain. Say you're coming off of the curb while you're running and you feel that sharp pain in your ankle. Um, Typically you're not going to be able to continue running or you wouldn't be able to continue running without a severe limp. Um, And in this case we want to stop. A chronic injury is an injury caused from overuse. It usually kind of creeps up maybe once in a while during your runs and will start to present itself more often and not be as easily relieved by rest and recovery. Uh, An example of this would be iliotibial band friction syndrome, so some pain on the outside of that knee for anyone who's had it. Uh, And so, Deneen, we talked just really briefly, but what is the most common injury that you see or discomfort that you see and I think folks you'll relate to this. Yeah, the most common thing I see in my practice for sure is runner's knee. So runner's knee is kind of an overarching um, term for any pain in and around the kneecap. Uh, The nice part about runner's knee is that it's very effectively treated by strengthening um, programs, strengthening and a little bit of stretching and muscle re-coordination, but certainly we see a ton of knees in our practice. Yes. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I'm not going to interrupt all the time, but <laughs> I know that's what I hear most commonly when I visit run walk groups, folks. So you're not alone when you've got some kind of pain anywhere in your body, but particularly the knee. And so Denise will help you with that as we move forward here. Yeah. 
Um, so again, talking about acute injuries, this is an example of an ankle sprain. So I'm sure many of you have experienced this at one time or another. Um, and typically we roll over top of that ankle with the inside of our foot coming up towards us. And that causes some injury to the ligaments of the ankle on the outside there. This is really important to get this uh, treated soon. We certainly don't want to be running on an unstable ankle that has some ligament damage. Um, and typically we want to get into a physiotherapist or healthcare professional that we're comfortable with to treat this. Nasty. That thing is nasty. <laughs> um, so when we want to treat these acute injuries, we use this Price or P rice principle. I'm sure lots of people have heard of rice, but we wanted to add the P in to make sure that you're protecting. Um, if you can't walk without limping, use crutches because you're going to cause injuries elsewhere your knees, your hips, your low back. We don't want to be walking um, with a limp all around all day. We want to rest. So Rest it doesn't mean that you just need to lay up on the couch. We want to make sure that your training does not regress too much while we're treating these acute injuries. So active rest is still safe for these types of injuries. So when you can't run or walk with a sprained ankle, you can maybe try to get on a stationary bike. Those are really nice because they have a nice good grounding for the ankle and there's good control there. Um, then we want ice. So 10 to 15 minutes on or off for the first 72 hours is best. This will really help with your um, your pain tolerance. So this will take down the pain. Um, a lot of people used to think that it was helpful with swelling. More research has shown that ice isn't actually the best thing for swelling. That's where the CNE come in. So we want some compression over that ankle or that acute injury, whatever is swollen. You want to wrap a tensor bandage around it. Get a good amount of pressure, but just make sure that on either end of the tensor bandage you're not getting additional swelling kind of bubbling out. Um, and then elevation, so elevating above your heart. And one of the most common things we see when people try to elevate injuries is they might, you know, pull their leg up and put it on the bench next to them while they, you know, continue to watch TV or whatever it happens to be. But this elevation needs to be above the level of your heart. So you need to get that chest below wherever that injury is if possible. And then you really want to get out to a health professional. A physiotherapist can help um, with most of your common aches, sprains, strains, and that'll allow you to get back to your sport quicker. What about ibuprofen or Voltaren? I see, you know, there's a lot of use of those. Yeah, absolutely. And I typically, with the ibuprofen um, and the NSAIDs specifically, um, we want to use them in the first little while. Again, it's going to um, help us reduce the swelling, reduce kind of that aggressive um, injury healing that's going on at first. But we like to try, once the pain is manageable, we like to try to um, reduce our use of those. You don't always want to mask the symptoms of your injury, especially if you're using the ibuprofen or Voltaren to work through your runs. We want to be able to feel when we're when we're doing more damage or when we're injuring ourselves further. Makes sense. Yeah. So again, with the ice versus heat, so ice would be for acute injuries. Again, those first 48 to 72 hours, um, on and off for 15 minutes, and you want to protect yourself from this. So while we definitely need the ice to be cold, you don't want to see any long-term reddening of your skin. So your skin will get a little bit red when the ice is on, but that shouldn't last for more than a half an hour once the ice has come off. Um, and ice is also good for those hot, red, swollen types of injuries um, or for pain that appears during activity. So afterwards, you can ice that off. Heat is best for stiffness and tension. Um, so sometimes, you know, it can feel really nice to put heat on our low back or our neck after a long day at the office. Um, it can be used in contrast with ice and cold, and that can help con to control that swelling that has persisted longer than a few days. And it can also be used in contrast to aid in recovery from long or intense activity. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some of our com common chronic run-walk injuries. So these are things like runner's knee, my most common one, iliotibial band friction syndrome, uh, foot and ankle pains, and shin splints. So runner's knee, again, is just a term used to describe generalized pain around the kneecap.
signs and symptoms um, can include a dull ache or pain under or around the patella, your kneecap, during or after activity. We particularly see pain with this while we're going downstairs or downhill or after sitting for too long. Causes of this um, are a bit of muscle overactivity. So in some of our hip flexor muscles, we see a little bit of overactivity. And then weak muscles in the backs of our hips, those glute, that glute needs specifically. Um, poor footwear can contribute to this. If you're rolling in towards the middle of your foot or over pronating, we can see this. And then too much too soon. So those people who kind of hop off the couch, decide to run 5K three times a week without really getting their body conditioned for it. So let's, treatment. oh, sorry. Yeah. I just was thinking before we do treatment, which we're getting to is, you know, we tap into our, our hip flexors when we overstride a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and so I was just going to draw attention to the photo for those that are viewing here. And if you see the gal who is one of our trusty leaders there, right there, this one, um, this is, is a nice placement in that her, you can see when she's landing, she's landing right under her hips. And so those glutes that you're talking about, those glutes are those high muscles on just under your seat. The strength is tapped into them there when she takes her next stride versus a little potential danger there in the gal that's wearing the gray hoodie. Uh, she's got a quite the heel toe action there as a as a runner that's great for walking but as a runner there's some potential danger there because as she's extending forward it'd be much better uh, if her foot was landing under her hip as opposed to in that position because she's gonna she's not gonna be able to use the strength of her glutes that way so folks that's why when we're out there we talk about doing that nice little rhythm the little uh, you know a tiny stride very little knee lift and in fact landing on your midfoot so that you land under your hips as opposed to extending in front of you. There. Coach, yeah, absolutely. Coach Lynn, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a really good point, Lynn. And research has shown if you're landing underneath your center of gravity or your center of mass that the forces that you actually propel back up through your body, so that ankle, knee, hip, low back, are reduced by over two times versus when we're running with a heel strike. So definitely good to stay over top of those feet and ensure we're not over striding. Um, so treatment when we're looking at runner's knee include a good warm up and this is where we want, we want to connect with those glutes. We want to you know, do some clamshells or band walks um, in order to connect with those glutes. We want to strengthen the hip muscles even outside of our warm up. So getting into the gym, getting in some cross training in order to strengthen our glute muscles. We want to take a peek at our footwear. What does that look like? You guys have a lot of uh, great sponsors and uh, I know the right shoe is actually quite near me and I love to go in and chat with them and chat with the staff there um, regarding, you know, footwear and what we can wear to try to stay healthier. Um, trying to run or walk on opposite sides of the street or a different surface. So there is a certain grade to your sidewalks and your roads when you're running. And so if you, you know, change up your um, route every once in a while or try going a different way, that might help you with uh, some of the different stresses that you're feeling. And then getting assessed by a physio if the pain persists for uh, more than three runs or walks and you're not managing it well with rest. You know, folks, too, now that we have, have a little more sunshine, you can find your way over to the nice soft trails that are somewhere in your neighborhood. Uh, last night, this is a funny thing, last night at a, with a group, I was leading them through uh, to a trail and I actually, they were, they were actually, what's the word, they were mutinous because the trail was muddy. And I said, <laughs> you are not real runners and walkers yet, folks. You, those shoes can get a little muddy, and let's just give the body a break and get on those trails. So don't be, you know, and they're like, no, we're staying on the pavement. I said, no, please take advantage of this surface. So, yes, vary the terrain. You'll so prevent these run-walk discomforts. Absolutely. I would definitely agree with you, Lynn. If your running shoes are not muddy, <laughs> you need to get onto the trails. Okay. 
Okay. Okay, so now going on to iliotibial band friction syndrome. And signs and symptoms of this are pain typically on the outside of the knee, just above or below the joint. So it can be worse with downhill or sta stairs and comes on slowly as a run progresses. Um, this, this is really similar to runner's knee. The iliotibial band plays a lot into the runner's knee symptoms as well. Um, and again, it can be a result of too much downhill running or poor control of the knee alignment. We'll see a really good picture of that in a little bit. Um, but yeah, we really need to work on strengthening those hips and making sure all of that is great um, and strong in order to be strong in our downhill running particularly. And you know, um, if we just, can we just go back to that photo for one second? Absolutely. It was, it's a good photo in that um, injuries can take place because you have too much rotation in your upper body. And those of you that have had me visit your, your run walk group know that I, I often talk about being careful not to cross the midline of the body in your arm swing. So these two, the leader and the young guy there are actually doing a great job in that their hand placement is not beyond, you know, that midline of the body. And be aware of that. Look at yourself even in the mirror because sometimes when, you know, you, you vision how you actually swing your arms when in fact it's quite different when you're out there. So look in the mirror, stand in front of the mirror in a in a running stance with one foot forward and the other back and practice swinging those arms forward and back, whether you're a walker or whether you're a runner uh, and, and just see if you can generate the swing from the shoulder as opposed to the torso, meaning your waist swinging side to side to generate your arm swing as opposed to the arms physically swinging forward and elbow back. Okay, and you'll avoid the wrong kind of torque on the knee, which in turn can cause something like this IT band friction syndrome. Awesome, perfect. And so again, treatments for IT band friction syndrome include a good warm up strengthening your hip muscles and good control of the knee in a squat position. Again, we'll look at a single leg squat later on. You want to avoid hill training until you're strong enough and the pain subsides. And again, this is more related to that downhill versus an uphill. And then we want to loosen up the IT band and the surrounding muscles with some self-massage, foam roller and tennis ball. Um, we are, you know, research has been showing that foam rolling over the IT band specifically hasn't uh, really produced the effects that we thought it once did. Um, and we can actually roll over the lateral quad or the outside of the quad muscle, the front of the thigh, versus being right over that IT band, which tends to be a little bit more comfortable. So it's not such a torturous activity. Okay, so the single leg squat. So looking at good form versus bad form. Picture A here shows a really strong single leg squat. If you look up at this person's waistband of their pants, which is representing our pelvis here, that person's pelvis is in really good alignment, meaning their low back and their hips are going to be really healthy. And the knee and foot are again coming down in what we would consider a good biomechanical motion. They're staying in line with each other and they're nice and strong, usually as a result of really good hip and core strength. As uh, as opposed to picture B where you see the pelvis is dropped on the side that uh, where the leg is up and the knee is coming inwards towards the body. When I actually finished my first ever half marathon, I got my pictures that back and I was astounded to see that I was actually running basically with my knees together for the last three kilometers of wow. the run. Yeah. <laughs> definitely something we want to avoid, definitely before my days as a physiotherapist, um, but we want to make sure that we're running in good control just to protect those knees, hips, low back, and ankles for sure. For alignment purposes, gang, I mean the best thing you can do are those ABCs you hear me talking about, those marching drills where you're lifting your knee up and then the foot comes down virtually under your hip, not with a big step, so that you just learn what that alignment is like. And again, your notion of lifting your knee and where you're lifting in relation to where your hips are and your shoulders are might be quite different than, it, than you think. So do it in front of a mirror and see where your knee is tracking when you do a marching drill. 
Okay, so various foot and ankle pains. So we kind of group these together because there are so, so many of them that can come up. Um, but some questions to ask, you know, is your foot going numb when you run? Are your shoes too tight? Those, you know, that end of your foot um, uh, where your toes come out of, I guess, um, can really get compressed in that toe box of your shoes. We want to make sure that our shoes are not too tight and compressing in there because we can damage a lot of nerves and the vessels that run there. Are you clenching your toes? Are you pulling your toes underneath you while you run? We really want to make sure that we're not overusing those toe grippers to make up for um, weakness elsewhere. Do the backs of your heels hurt, especially on uphill sections? Take a look at your Achilles tendon. How does it feel if you pinch along it? You know, is there pain there? Um, it shouldn't be painful. Uh, what you can do there is you can stick to flat surface, stretch your calves out, make sure your calves are strong enough, and wear shoes with a slight heel lift and proper support in order to offload that during the day. And then what about the bottom of your heel near the back of your arch in the morning? Uh, plantar fasciitis is a very, very common running injury, and we see it a lot in different patients. It's hard to get rid of once it gets fairly bad. Um, so you want to warm up your feet in the AM, you know, do some uh, toe points and raises in order to warm up those calves. Roll it out on a tennis ball or a cold water bottle um, and stretch out the calves and particularly the big toe. We really want to see good big toe extension to stretch that plantar fascia and we want to wear supportive shoes. Gang, the other th you'll hear me tell you to wake up in the morning before you get out of bed and and draw the letters of the alphabet with your feet just so you have a start and finish to what Deneen is talking about. Just stretching out every the fascia on the bottom of your feet using your toes stretching out your calves as you draw the letters of the alphabet you will it's it seems like a silly little thing but man it can make a difference for both plantar fasciitis as well as any issues with your calves and achilles area yeah, absolutely. We tend to sleep in almost a toe-pointed position, so those types of things really tighten up overnight. Um, and then we're getting into shin splints. So again, this is a global term. It's used to describe many different conditions that can cause pain in the front of the lower leg. So symptoms include pain, tenderness, and potentially swelling. This isn't always visibly noticeable for you. Um, that occurs in the front of the shin, along the ridge of the bone, or in the muscle tissue. Again, causes include too much, too fast, or too hard, um, poor improper footwear, running surface, um, again, getting onto the trails versus always doing that road running, and stre strength and flexibility and balances. Often we see this, again, those tight calves um, and those muscles in the front of the leg are having to do far too much work in order to overcome the tightness of those calves. So now we're going to talk about the R's of recovery, the rest, recover, and rejuvenate. So we want to rehydrate, and we definitely know that we need lots of water um, in our bodies when we're running, but sometimes water doesn't do enough. You know, we might need something with an electrolyte in it. We um, might need some of those special drinks. You know, Gatorade's obviously the most common example. There are better alternatives on the market as far as less sugar and uh, it's still getting the same electrolytes. But a really great way to monitor this is you can actually monitor your pee color during the day. Is it, you know, kind of a straw yellow versus a bright yellow or orange? That can help you gauge how, um, how dehydrated you may be. We want to refuel properly. So you want to eat something within 20 minutes of your run in order to repl replenish your carbohydrate stores that you've used up in your muscles. Your muscles run off of carbohydrates. So we want to really give those back. Good, simple, well, complex carbohydrates are um, easily digested by the body and can get back to those muscles to help them recover. So realignment. So we use a lot of forward moving muscles as runners, but very little of our sideways moving muscles. And this happens, you know, to be one of the main reasons we get injured. So we want to think of those side shuffles, side leg lifts, you know, the old aerobics activities. Um, clamshells are one of my favorite exercises for runners to connect with those lateral moving muscles. Recovery techniques. So it's important to give your body a break from running. Contrast baths can be great, are not always an option for those of us just at home. Um, but after a hard or long run, go for a swim or an easy bike ride the next day. Give that body a bit of a change of pace. 
we want to regain muscle length. So muscles shorten as we use them. We want them to be long again for our next workout. So we want to do some stretching. We want to do some rolling after our activities in order to allow that to happen. And we want to release tension. So muscles develop bands of tension due to use. These can pull on our joints and especially the knee and we need to massage them out. And then of course rest. And we've already talked about that active versus passive component. So when to keep going versus when to stop. We want to keep moving if our pain goes away after a couple of minutes or by changing speed or a running surface. So you can try slowing down, you can walk for a few minutes and then run again, or you can hop off of the sidewalk there onto the grass and try running a little bit on there. We want to keep moving if it's not really pain rather than just heavy legs from fatigue. You really, really want to push through this part of your run. This is where a lot of our run adaptations take place. And we want to really focus on our form here and make sure we're doing well with that. And then if our pain disappears the next day and is managed with the price and the R's of recovery. When to stop and get advice from a physio or other healthcare professional that you trust. Um, an acute lower, in, lower body injury, including the lower back. Again, those ones that you know you've done something wrong right as soon as it happens. A chronic injury that is painful on every step and doesn't ease up. Pain that wakes you up or keeps you up at night. For sure, we want to get that checked out as soon as possible. And pain that doesn't go away after one week despite a change in shoes, running surface, intensity, speed, and those rest principles we discussed. Oh, my. Such good information. And our half an hour has already run out. We can, <laughs> it's sad that we can talk forever about discomforts. <laughs> But we don't want you to have them. We don't want you to experience them. So, you know, we'll finish this webinar quickly here by just suggesting that if, like on that last slide where Deneen was talking about the signs and symptoms that you might experience that are not going away, then take a break, get off the impact, jump onto, this is an elliptical trainer here, even a, a treadmill, well, that's a different impact, so it sort of falls more in line with changing the surface that you're running and walking on. There's Deneen there doing a little climbing, it looks like. That looks like a lot of fun. But interjecting your running and walking with other activities is always a good idea. Variety is always good. And if you need a full break from impact, let's get, get stronger in the core, but by by using elliptical trainers or a spin bike here with not so much resistance, just keeping your turnover, you will maintain you know, a fitness that will allow you to transition back to your running and walking when the body is ready. The best transfer bar none is getting in that water and yes, it's wet. And I can't say I'm proud to say I did a lot of miles in the water, and I still do. But go in the water, put a waist, a, a belt on that's a flotation device, and try to mimic your running and walking that you do on land in the deep end of a pool. You keep your head above water with a run-walk action. Arms forward and back, legs forward and back, almost like a marching drill in the water. Over the barrel bees, I like to say. Lift up and over a barrel or an imaginary log in front of you and use your hamstrings to pull. And that water will keep you strong and give you a massage effect at the same time and your aerobic fitness will be possibly better than it's ever been. So uh, we've got to say bye-bye for now. We will. The next time we have our webinar will be literally days before the culmination of this program, April 23rd is the Vancouver Sun Run, and we'll have some tips and advice to help you get ready for your event, wherever it may be. So thanks so much for joining us. Deneen, thank you for being here with all that great advice. Thank Are you, you for having me. Oh, awesome. Once again, she's at City Sports if you want to find her in the city, City Sports Physio Clinic. Thanks, everybody. Keep on trucking. Love what you're doing. Be proud of yourself, and we will see you next time.